Good morning, Redemption Church. God bless you. So good to see all of you here today. Welcome. Um, do we have any first-time visitors in the house? Anybody at all? Well, God bless you all. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? And um, no place I'd rather be on a beautiful Sunday morning than the house of the Lord. Um, as we get started today, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you so much for today, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful day outside, Lord, and your sweet presence in here. We ask, Lord, that you would have your way in this service today, Lord. Be with the praise team as they lead us into your presence, Father, and be with the pastor as he brings us the message, Lord, and prepare our hearts, Lord, for what you want to do in us today. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all you've done and all you're going to do. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, church. been through the type of week that you've had we've come in this house to give God praise and honor and glory because he is worthy can we just give God a great big hand of appreciation this morning for who he is and all that he's done and all that he is doing in our lives amen we're going to sing this familiar song that most people probably know and we ask that you'll sing along and join with us Father, open the eyes of my heart how many of you want your eyes to be open this morning our spiritual eyes, our gates to be open. We ask God that He will open our eyes this morning to see things the way He sees them. And that He'll continue to lead us.
to see him. Amen. You are a great God. Thank you, Jesus. above all names.
This time, Mr. Shemaine is going to come and give us a scripture reading for today. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. coming from Psalms 119 verses 1 through 3 and also verses 33 through 48. It says, Joyful are the people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they work only in his path. Teach me your decrees, O Lord, and I will keep them to the end. Give me the understanding and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all my heart. Make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. Give me an eagerness for your laws, rather than a love for money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful ways, for your regulations are good. I long to obey your commandments, renew my life with your goodness. Lord, give me your unfailing love, the salvation that you promised me. Then I can answer those who taunt me, for I trust in your word. Do not snatch a word of truth from me, for your regulations are my only hope. I will keep on obeying your instructions forever and ever. I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. I will speak to kings about your laws, and I, I will not be ashamed. How I delight in your commandments, how I love them. I honor and love your commands. I meditate on your decrees. According to Acts 13, 22, David, who's the author of this song, was said to be a man after God's own heart. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty significant recognition considering no one else in the Bible was given that honor. Of course, Jesus takes the crown, but you understand the point that I'm trying to make. Yet, despite this great honor, we know that David's life was far from perfect. He had many successes and failures. So what was so special about David that caused him to stand out above all the rest? It was his heart. He was consistently pointed toward God. He was passionate about the Lord, and he had a deep desire to follow and do the Lord's will. So the question I ask you today as I close is, what direction does your heart point? Meaning, who or what is your greatest focus? Are you a man or woman after God's own heart? The condition of your heart is an accurate barometer of your faith. These are questions I had to ask myself, and it's caused me to look at life differently and make some personal changes. And I hope you do the same. May God bless the reading and teaching of his word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Mr. Shemaine is doing such an incredible job with leading our young people, and he has structured the Wednesday night services. Um, I didn't even see Eric on Wednesday because Eric says, I'm overwhelmed. All I want to do is take the bus, pack up the backpacks, pack up the food, pick up the kids, take them home. And he got his wish. And thank God for sending Shumane because we have structure on a Wednesday night. The bus comes. They know what time to get dropped off, what time the classes start. We meet here, and they do a, a uh, revisit of what the topic was last week. Then they break off into the classes. We don't even have room in this whole building. Each room is filled with a different class, different age group, and then they know what time to go home. My kids, they were with us. We were in the class this week, and they had so much fun, and the kids are getting fed spiritually. We thank God for that. Miss Anna is back there, and she's doing a wonderful job with uh, to taking care of those kids. And um, we got some exciting things in store for you because I asked her to do something special for uh, Mother's Day, and she said we're going to borrow some of those kids from Wednesday night and bring them to the Sunday morning service. Hopefully we'll start getting some of their kids and their parents in here, and we're so grateful for what God is doing. Pastor Jerry, Mr. Glenn, Mr. Allen, Kevin, every week he's here faithfully, and, and uh, you guys mean so much to this church and this community. Without you guys, we would not have a church. It's great to see Pastor Felix and Miss Yvonne this morning, and we're just going to sing this um, this song about all the reasons we have to praise God. And, and it talks about 
10,000 reasons. You know, I was, I was at home this week, and um, I didn't really tell anybody, but Andres, you know, she was up in Tennessee uh, for about a month taking care of her mom. Um, and so, so she had missed work, so she decided to go to work this week. And uh, while I was home with the kids, they had a, a fever, and thankfully the baby didn't have it. But I was there, and, and while I was there, I, I needed to get some work done. But while I was um, working, the Holy Spirit, something just told me, just the kids asked to watch a TV show, so they were watching it, and um, something told me, just go over there and sit with them. And I sat with my son Liam while Haven and Aaliyah were on the couch. We were all sitting there, and um, I'm holding Liam, and I was not aware that he had a temperature. And while I was holding him, he started having a seizure, and I just started to panic because I thought he was shivering. Then I realized it was a seizure, and I had to strip his clothes off and put an ice pack on him, put a wet rag on his head, and call 911. They said, we can't give you medical advice over the phone. We could send paramedics. And I just started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over him. Thankfully, he broke out of that seizure, and everything was okay. And it was like I was having an out-of-body experience because there I was panicking on the inside, but in the outside, I had to stay calm give him the medicine, check his temperature, put him in the bath, make sure that everything was taken care of. And I knew not to call my wife. She was at work. She would have panicked. And I could only call on God, but it was like, it didn't hit me till the next day. I was sitting in my truck and I just broke down in tears. And I thought, God, we have so many reasons just to say thank you. The very breath in our lungs is enough to say thank you. And for the miracles that you have not only done, but you do every day. I went to my son's room last night and I just wanted to see that he was breathing. And when I saw that he was breathing, I said, thank God for breath. You know, we just take so many things for granted. We're busy criticizing and complaining. But this song talks about having 10,000 re 10, reasons to give God praise. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'll join in and sing this song with us as we get ready to pour in and just give God the praise that he deserves, the honor that he deserves in this place this morning. Hallelujah.
this time, Mr. Glenn is going to come and receive this morning's offering as you may be seated. topic this morning is offering. Two points have been confirmed, and I hope this will further confirm that the Lord speaks to each one of us. Giving. The Bible uses first fruits, or giving your best. Keeping God first in all our affairs. And God made us all uniquely different individuals reflecting who we are in Christ. Roger's thesaurus references giving, a donation, an offering, a presentation, a delivery, as God gave us deliverance. It is given by God for our sins. I surrender as in giving my life to Christ. Giving as a provision providing as a as a per, as a parent for your children as we heard pastor speak this morning giving an award a reward it can be appreciation acknowledgement a gratuity giving as in service and giving as in our military for those who have given all as Christ gave all for each one of us. Giving is not just for Sunday. Giving is a way of life. And giving builds legacy. When my kids were young, I worked to give them everything I could. But what they really wanted was my time. I thank the pastor for sharing that he was there and able to be with his kids when it was necessary. My wife was there so many times when I wasn't. I thank God for that. Now you can't give what you don't have, and this references stewardship over money, time, and everything that God gives us, this building and everything. So thank you for that. Coming comes in many forms, as you addressed the scripture reading about the heart and that is where it comes from I was asked to pray before we take up the offering this morning so Lord I want to thank you for confirmation that the three things spoken this morning would honor you and that in everything we do take this offering and receive it for the building of your kingdom in any way possible that you see As you give this morning, I asked Mr. Allen to give a testimony just before the word. He must have slipped out. <laughs> um, but um, when he comes back, you'll hear from him. Oh, there he is. He's, he's wearing many hats this morning. <laughs> I was reflecting yesterday, I was talking to one of my friends, he's a police officer in Nashville, and he said, you know how many dead babies I have carried out, and he said, that could have that could have been deadly, and he, he has a daughter, a baby girl, and he has another daughter on the way, him and his wife, and uh, he just couldn't stop thinking about that, he said, you know, I can't imagine that, I hope that never happens again, he said, I don't know what I would have done, I would have panicked, there was no way I would have been able to handle that and uh, I thank God for the Holy Spirit and his comfort and peace in the time of storm and um, he said I would have definitely called the paramedics to come but you know when I was thinking about it the thing that really broke me down was how big God is we serve a big God and we shouldn't expect anything less than miracles and wonders and him giving us the the solutions for our problems so, so many times we are trying to figure out life and handle it on our own, do things our way, 
But God is the one who created us, and all we have to do is put our troubles in his hands. As I think about the disciples in the boat, Jesus was sleeping while there was a storm, and they woke him up, and they were bothering him. They were tormented by the storm in their life, and Jesus was sleeping. And you may feel like you're in a storm. I want to let you know that Jesus is sleeping. He's resting. It's not that he doesn't care. He woke up, and he said to them, you have little faith. And he said, he spoke to the storm. And he said, what did he say? He said, be still. So whatever storm in your life that is going around, you speak to that storm and you say, be still in the name of Jesus. Because his word says that, that, that whatever you speak according to my name, you can say to this mountain, be moved. And by faith, it shall be done. And God is allowing you to experience some things because he's wanting you to have bigger faith, but it takes trusting in him, and literally it takes you surrendering. You can't have faith until you surrender. When you're there trying to figure out life and do all that you can do to make things work, and you're trying, and you're, you're working, and you're exhausted, you're using all the knowledge, all the power, all the resources you have, Jesus is just sitting back waiting for you to say, okay, daddy, you do it, you know, and, and so many things as I was spending time with my, my kids this week, you know, and, and my, my daughter asked me for a drink of water, and I was thinking, how can I ever say no to her? You know, I gave her the water, and, and Jesus reminded me, his text says, if we ask him and we are evil, know how to give good gifts to our kids. Like Glenn said, we know how to provide. We know how to put food on the table. We know how to put gas in the car. You'll do whatever it takes. One time I had a job, and literally I was shoveling um, poop. I mean, seriously, when I, when, I, mean, I was making good money doing it, but I was doing it because I had to take care of my family. And, and I will do whatever it takes to provide for my family. But, you know, God wants us to have that same, uh, same thought towards him, that he's our heavenly father, and he would not withhold any good gift from you. Every good and perfect gift is from above. He's a good God. He's a great God. He's a big God. He cares about you, but you have to put it in his hands. And there, my, my son, he was trying to figure something out, and he tried and tried, and I sat there, and I looked at him, and finally said, Daddy, can you help me? And when he said, can you help me, I helped him figure out the problem that he was facing. And when we try to figure things out and do it on our own, God is just sitting back waiting. Ask him, asking. He said, whatever you want, ask the Lord so he'll give it to you. He said, you have not because you ask not. Whatever you're going through, ask God today to make it right. Ask God for help. Ask God for solution. Ask God for still and peace, peace in the middle of your storm. Amen. Mr. Allen is going to come and share a plus, uh, powerful testimony. I, I met with him, uh, my family and I, we got together with them Sunday, and he said, this story that I'm, I want to share with you, Pastor, is goes right in hand with your sermon that you preached last week on unforgiveness. If you missed that, be sure to go watch it. God has given us some things that I want to share with you, and when he gave me this story, I said, oh my goodness. I said, you know what? The rest of the church needs to hear that, and we greet those that are watching online. Cindy Burroughs, please keep Eva in your prayers. Um, she just had a birthday, but her, her brother-in-law just passed away. She's going through a little storm right now, but we pray that God will continue to keep her and cover her. Miss Cindy's watching online, getting ready for surgery and, and recovery, but we pray for her and those that are in, uh, just watching from all over. God bless you, but let this testimony be a, a blessing in your life today, all right? Mr. Allen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, last week's sermon on forgiveness, how many of you were here? Powerful, powerful message, and you know, it just spoke to it just spoke to my heart amen and this testimony isn't my testimony it's a testimony of a very close friend of mine and Maria's and um, her name is Linda Markowitz um, been a friend of the families for gosh probably 30 years since my kids were little and she's a she's a minister of the gospel she has a ministry and in fact she has a book I'm not here selling a book but this is a book about this story right here and what had happened <clears throat> She had, she has two daughters, and this has been probably about 29, 30 years ago. Um, anyways, her daughter was dating a, a gentleman, well, not dating a guy, and basically what had happened was is that they had gotten to an argument, and in a fit of rage, this man killed her daughter. In a fit of rage, he, she, he basically, he shot her with a revolver and, and killed this girl in her prime. And um, 
Linda had, the last time she had saw her daughter, it was Mother's Day, so it had been about a month. And she had got the call. And um, anyways, I'm not going to go into detail of that moment. But basically, what had happened was, and, and, and I remember it like it was yesterday, because it wasn't far from our house. It was within a few miles where they lived. I did not know her. I had met her daughter, but I knew Linda real well. Anyways, as the story goes, that she began to, the darkness and, and, and the hatred and all that almost overtook her, the anger and, 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 the, and, and what would all you could only imagine what would come with that, right, to lose one of your children. And um, what she knew she had to do, she realized that as a minister of the gospel, she was going to have to come to grips with this, and someday she knew she was going to have to forgive this man. She knew it in her heart. And she had a visitation of the Lord that's just a beautiful, beautiful story, and, and I certainly can't tell that the way she tells it. But she said, the Lord just spoke to my heart, and said, you have to forgive this man. You have to forgive this man. And, and what she decided to do was, you know, she, she said, you know, I'm, I'm a minister of the gospel. I have to do this. So she had come to that place in her heart that she was going to forgive this young man. And what she did, she wrote him a letter, and, and she put it in the mail and was able to send this man a letter saying that she had forgiven him. And, and, I, and, I, and I can remember what... I was thinking at the time, I've got three sons, nine grandkids, and for any of you that have children, you can only imagine what that would be like, right? Just something as tragic as that and to, to, to lose a child, and, and I, I, can only, I can only imagine. But I don't know that I have what it takes to, I, I would hope I have what it takes to do that. But I didn't know at the time, I was just like, you know, I just don't know if I could do that. I just don't know if I could do that. And over time, I realized I've met this man has since been released from prison. He did almost 25 years in prison. And what the Lord told her to do, not only to forgive him, and she didn't tell him this at the time. She said, I want you to embrace him as a son. And she said, I don't know how to do that. I don't know if I can do that. He forgave him, and what has happened, what the Lord has done, a remarkable thing. I've met this man. He's out. He's free, and he's a born-again Christian. He's saved. He, he, he loves the Lord. He had a true experience with the Lord, and they minister together. They have a ministry. I, I, so, so it's really a miraculous story of the power of forgiveness that only Jesus can give us the strength to do, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine having the strength to do that on my own. But through the Lord, amen, whatever we face, whatever we go through, I mean, we can, you know, we can do things, you know, we just lay it in his hands, right? We just say, Lord, I can't do this. Show me how you can do this, right? But anyways, this is a remarkable story. It really is. And, you know, like I said, I, I, you know, the book is fantastic. And I'm not selling the book, but if any of you would be interested, I could get you this book. But not selling books. I just want to, just, Pastor just wanted me to share that, amen. The power of forgiveness, amen. Wasn't that powerful? When he told me that, I said, man, you got to share that. Other people need to hear it. Like he said, I don't know if I could find that in my heart. Somebody shot my baby girl. Woo, I might be going to prison too. I'm just kidding. But um, honestly, <laughs> we'll both be in there together, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Mr. Glenn. I'm kidding. <laughs> But, but well, there's a couple of things I want to focus on. What he said is that man had a true experience of being a born-again Christian. See, some of us can come to church. We can serve in the church. But unless we have a true experience of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, we won't find that in our heart to give forgiveness. And, um, and, and the other thing that he said that was incredible, I actually forgot, but it'll come back to me. And when it does, I'll share it with you. But, but that is just a powerful story. And, um, yeah, the other thing he said was he didn't think he could find it in his heart to do that and, and un unless God gave him the strength. And that is the way it is with forgiveness. In our flesh, we can't. We just can't get past it. But I thank God for the power of his Holy Spirit, which will give us what we need 
to be able to forgive those who have hurt us. Amen? Mother's Day is coming up, and I love what you shared, Mr. Glenn. There's so many times that the mothers of our kids have been there when we weren't. They've never stepped away or abandoned their kids, um, and we want to make sure we make our mothers feel special. This is a reminder to the men, the husbands, the fathers, that Mother's Day is just in about two weeks or so, and um, go ahead and plan now how you're going to make her feel special and what gifts you're going to get. Amen. It's great to see Dr. Mann here today with his son, Michael. Good to see you, Brother Michael. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. They went together with Ray, and they had a, a, a good time this week, drove out of state, and, he, and uh, he's a man that won't miss a Sunday. I mean, if, if most of us drove at age 92 to another state, we'd probably be at home resting right now. But, Dr. Mann, thank you for your faithfulness. God bless you. Amen. I want to sort of do a continuation of last week, um, and, and the Lord has been giving me some stuff that I want to share with you, and I, I want to come from the book of Luke chapter 6, not the, not the full chapter, but just the last half of it, and there are some things that I believe that the Lord wants us to do, and how he wants us to respond to the hurt, how he wants us to treat people, and I trust and pray that this will be a blessing to you that you can take it and share it with somebody that you know. Amen. Father God, I just come before you today, and we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house. We give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you, Lord. I pray that these words that are coming out of my mouth, that they will be from you, that your people will hear, open up their hearts, their minds, their ears, their understanding, Lord, that they can understand what you are saying and, and hide the word in their heart and apply it to their lives and share it with a friend, share it with a loved one. And... Lord, I just give you praise and honor and glory, and I thank you, Lord, for who you are and for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, remember those that are online, too, that are watching. Bless them, and those who are sick, not able to be here, that you'll comfort them in the name of Jesus. I, uh, <clears throat> last week, as I did the funeral for my friend that was 35 years old, I knew him since I was like 11, and just watching him literally just laying there in that coffin, the mom crying, and we all think, you know, we're going to live till 70, 80, 90, 92, like Dr. Mann and beyond. And we may not always get that chance. We may not always get that opportunity. You never know when your time will come to an end. Only God knows. And so as I was sitting there and I've just been reflecting on that, I said, Lord, when I'm, when I'm laying in, in my casket, if, if that happens before you come, I don't want to regret anything. And whatever you have put me here to do, I want to be... I want you to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to do whatever you have put me here to do. Because the word of God tells us in so many different ways that, 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 uh, that this life here is, we're just here for a few days. This is not our home. Heaven is our home. There is an eternal life. God doesn't send anybody to hell. But we choose where we end up based off of the choices that we made in life. And I said, Lord, whatever it is, when my time comes, I want to know that I leave a full life behind of doing what you have called me to do. I mean, just looking at my buddy there, I know his spirit is not in there. That was just the outer, the housing for where his spirit dwelt in. But just sitting there lifeless. And, 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 and I've been to funerals like that where, you know, um, I had another buddy. He was 38, passed away. And his mom was looking at him, screaming, saying, wake up, wake up and come home. You know, it's, 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 her mind is all confused and she's, she's hurting. But our spirit is, 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 is what God wants us to stay in tune with his spirit. Because he said the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead will dwell in you. So we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers to the pulling down of strongholds. So it's spiritual warfare. And I want you all to see that because there is coming to come a time where your eyes will shut. Your body will go into the ground. The word of God says dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But the dead in Christ will rise. Our spirit will be with him. Amen. And so just remember that one day your life will, will come to an end. And the decisions that you've made, the choices that you've made, the things that you've done, God will hold you accountable and said, what, what, will, what have you done with the time, the resources that I have given you? And why should I let you into my kingdom? And he says, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I preach? Didn't I teach? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do good? If you go out these doors and you ask somebody, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And they say yes. And you ask them why. They'll tell you, most of them will start telling you 
all the good things that they have done. But the word of God says we are not saved by, by the good works that we have done, but nothing but the blood of Jesus, the salvation that comes through the faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that can save you. There's no amount of good that you can do because in that last day it says many. That means most people, most Christians will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? Didn't I do X, Y, and Z? Didn't I feed the, the hungry? Didn't I clothe the homeless? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. It is written in the text. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be part of that many category. I want to be part of the few that's chosen and called and accepted and approved by God. So whatever you do in this life, don't do it for God, for man's approval, for your boss's approval, not your pastor, not anybody, not even your mom and dad. You're held accountable to God. He's the one who holds you accountable. Make sure that you get his approval and that your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ by receiving him in your heart, accepting him. And guess what? Your fruits are going to flow. Your fruits are going to show. As I was studying, God gave me this title, and it's called Kingdom Citizens. We want to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Not just, yeah, we're in America. We live here, United States. But we are not citizens of earth. We are citizens of, of heaven. And so there, is a, there are a few things that, that I have studied and, and prepared. And I just want to share these things with you because I, I, it's been a blessing to me. I pray and trust that it will be a blessing to you. And it's coming. I'm starting at Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. It says that he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples. This is Jesus. And he said to them, blessed are you poor for yours is the kingdom of God. You poor, you humble in the spirit. Not necessarily he's talking about poverty, but humble, humility in the spirit of God. Not proud or prideful or puffed up, but blessed are the meek. He said, blessed are you who hunger now. And he says, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice, he says, in the day and leap for joy. As I was studying and meditating, the Lord showed me when people talk evil about you, when they say hurtful things about you, when you're doing good. God revealed to me that it is a privilege to be talked about when you're doing a service for God. He says rejoice when they do that because they hated Christ. They'll hate you too. So that means you're on the right track. They did it to Moses. They did it to David. They did it to all the godly men in the Bible. They rejected them. They rejected Christ. They put them on a cross. So you're part of that crowd, that multitude, the men and powerful women of God that served diligently, that they talked about. They told uh, Noah, you're crazy. You, 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 you're, 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 you've lost your mind. But he stayed faithful to God. So rejoice when people speak about you because count it a joy. It's a privilege uh, Paul said, I count it all joy when they do these things. And he said, indeed, your reward is great. So people here on earth think that rewards or a happy life means many possessions, a lot of money in the bank account and having a, a position or a title. And he says, no, he says, your reward is great in heaven because just like we did that funeral, everything that he has worked for, everything that you have gained in this life will stay right here for either somebody else to enjoy or whatever the case may be you can't take it with you he says store up treasures in heaven so he says your reward is great in heaven for in like manner their father did to the prophets but woe to you who are rich for you have already received your consolation woe to you who are full if you're already full then god can't put anything in you you have to empty yourself so god can fill you with his spirit there's some people who can't learn anything because they know it all. They know too much. You can't tell them anything. They're already full. So he says, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. He says, woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. See, when you're a citizen of the kingdom, you understand that everything with God is in reverse. He said, the first will be last and the last will be first. He said, if you want to find your life, you have to lose your life. One shall put a thousand, but two shall put ten thousand to flight. So he said, whoever wants to be great among you, let him be your servant. So when you think in the mindset of a kingdom citizen, it's in reverse. He says, if you mourn now, you'll weep later. He, said, he says, if you laugh now, you'll mourn and weep later. If you're hungry now, you're going to be full later. If you're full now, you'll be hungry later. If you're in lack now, you'll be full later. He said, your, your, your weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. 
So think of, a, as your, of yourself as a kingdom citizen. He says, woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. When people are giving you a bunch of command, uh, uh, compliments and saying how great you are and how wonderful you are, be careful. Because pride comes before destruction. And we get puffed up because people tell us, oh, you look good, you, 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 you make money, and you have a great job, and, and we let that get to our heads. And guess what? Those same people will put you down and stamp on you and walk over you. He says in verse 12 and 27, I say to you who hear, he says, love your enemies. Everything in the kingdom is reversed. Love your enemies. The world says to you, I'm going to treat others like they treat me. If you treat me nice, I'll be good to you. If you don't treat me nice, I won't treat you nice. That's what the world says. But God says, no. If you're a citizen of the kingdom, you do the reverse. He says, love your enemies. And then he says, he says do good to those that hate you. He said, bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Verse 29, to him who strikes you on the cheek. Guess what? Turn the other cheek. Here, get the other side. Get the other side. Go ahead and take another hit while you're at it. He says, who strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. And from him who takes away from your cloak, he says, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And he says in verse 32, but if you love those who love you, what credit do you have? He said, even sinners love those who love them. So how do you know that somebody is a citizen of the kingdom? You can love those who hate you. You can love your enemies. If you, don't, if you only love those who love you, that's how sinners act. And, and he says, there is no reward. There's no profit in that. He says, love those who, 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 who speak evil of you. He said, even sinners love those who love them. And he says, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And he says, if you lend to those who, who, if you lend to those who, from which you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? Some of us will only lend things to people we know he can pay us back. But are you willing to lend something to somebody with no expectation, knowing you may never get it again? You ever lend somebody something and they kept it so long you had to borrow it back? <laughs> he says, for sinners lend to sinners. To receive much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend. And he says, guess what? Hoping for what? Nothing in return. And he says, your reward will be great. There's another passage in Luke where he says, don't invite people to your house who have high accolades and high positions where they can repay you. He says, go and invite the poor and invite the lame, invite the crippled because your reward in heaven is going to be great. Everything in the kingdom as a citizen is in reverse. Amen. He said, but love your enemies, do good and lend. Hope for nothing in return. Your reward will be great. And he says, you'll be sons of the most high for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your father is also merciful. And he says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not you shall not be condemned. When you're judging, when you're pointing fingers, when you're criticizing, you got to be real careful because when you judge, God judges you. When you condemn, you shall be condemned. And he says, forgive and you will be forgiven. If you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. I mean, some of these things, it seems like it's so simple, but you, I want you to understand it in the spirit. And it's easy to preach about it and talk about it. But like Brother Allen said, until it hits home, when it hits home, then we have to walk the walk instead of just talking the talk and that's when it gets hard because as things happen in our lives you say I don't know if I could serve God through this and God is testing you are you still gonna worship me Abraham even though I'm telling you to sacrifice your son and by faith he went out and did what God has told him to be and be obedient are you gonna pass the test that you're in right now the storm that you're going through are you gonna hold on to God's unchanging hands or are you gonna give up on him and say you know what I'm walking away he says give and it will be given back to you he says good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you and he says, he spoke a parable to them. He says, 
can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a ditch? A disciple is, is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank or the log that is in your own eye? Here you are trying to get this little speck out of somebody else's eye. You're focusing on that so much when you have a whole log in your eye. One, one, one scholar says it's like if a doctor was, was performing surgery and trying to get a speck out of somebody's eye, but here he had a log in his eye. How can you make somebody see when you're blind yourself? How can you help them? And he says, when yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye. And he says, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. So first, work on yourself. Work on the things that you need to fix instead of always pointing the finger at somebody else and blaming somebody else. Think about how can I be a better Christian? How can I be a better spouse? How can I be a better parent? How can I be a better church member? How can I be a, a better neighbor? How can I be a better coworker? How can I be a better boss? Whatever you do, how can I be? But what can I do? Focus on yourself and ask God to reveal. Lord, show me. The, the, the closer we get to God, the more we see where we have fallen short. It's not that God is saying, I don't like you. He's saying, I want you to have a close relationship with me and I'm going to fix everything in your life that is not right that is not correct I'm going to correct those things through the power of the Holy Spirit and he says to them he says in verse 43 a good tree does not bear bad fruit if you're a citizen of the kingdom you cannot bear bad fruit a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and he says for every tree is known by its fruit you will know them by their fruit so as people call themselves Christians, what kind of fruits are they producing? What kind of fruits are you producing if you profess to be a Christian? Are you pro pro producing good fruits or are you producing bad fruits? Some people are producing no fruit. And Jesus cursed the fig tree because it was producing no fruit. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. For abundance, out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaks. And he says to them, um, and, and, and he says, And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation. So if you're a citizen of the kingdom and you have no foundation, guess what? When the storm comes, your house is going to fall apart. And he's saying, make sure you have a good foundation. And he says, um, when you build it on the house, there's like a man who built it on the house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. And then he says against life was difficult in that day for the people who Jesus was talking to. Just like us today, they hoped in their circumstances and they were hoping that it would be improved. Many of them, like us today, thought that happiness would come from having great possessions or positions. They thought that enjoying the pleasures of popularity and money could buy them true happiness. And so Jesus started addressing some of these things. Jesus, he taught that happiness was the opposite of what they expected. And he says, there's no amount of things that can substitute for a true relationship with God. Matthew 5 says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He said, blessed are they which hunger and thirst for righteousness. Found in Matthew 5. Jesus was calling for a brokenness of heart. He was looking at their heart. He was looking at what was on the inside. How can we rejoice when people attack us? How can we rejoice when people hurt us? Sometimes I can tolerate you hurting me, Pastor Felix, but don't mess with my wife because now you got a real problem. I can tolerate you hurting me, but don't mess with my kids because you're asking for trouble. We, we ever get that way? How do we treat people? How can we rejoice when they attack you, when they attack your family? 
And Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, it is a privilege to suffer for Christ's sake. So when you go through those storms, you can say, thank God, I know that I'm on the right track. If the enemy is not after you, I would be concerned. If there is no storm in your life, I would be concerned. Because the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. If he's not coming to you to steal anything, do you have anything that's worth stealing? If you have something that's worth stealing, the thief is coming. But if the thief is not after you, ask yourself, do I even have anything that's worth stealing? So rejoice when the enemy's after you, knowing that you're on the right track. Knowing that you're on the right path. And knowing that God is with you and fighting for you. As I reflected on those missiles and drones that went towards Israel, it reminded me of the Old Testament when God showed and the world saw that God was fighting for Israel. They shut those things down. And I'm like, God, we're living in those times. We're living in the last days. Those missiles, as they were stopped, I mean, God is fighting for you. He is on your side. He is for you. And he is not against you. Life is built on character. As kingdom citizens, your life is built on character. And character is built on every decision that you make. The good, the bad, the ugly, whatever decision you make. Be a man or a woman of integrity. That means you make the right decision even when nobody's around, when nobody's watching. Your character is built on the decisions that you make day to day. Doesn't mean, Brother Allen, that we're not going to slip and fall sometimes. But you get up and your focus is on God. Your focus is on Jesus Christ. Your focus is having a closer relationship to him. So you get up and you continue to produce fruits. You don't stay there and produce bad fruits and take your eyes off of Jesus. Decisions are based on the values that we have. The decisions that we make are based on what we believe about what God has said. Moses made life-changing decisions based on the values that other people thought were foolish. So you might be doing things and people say you're crazy or why are you going to church? Why are you serving a God who's not real? And why are you wasting your time? You may do things according to the word of God and the world will tell you you're crazy. You're, 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 you're stupid for going to church. I've literally had people tell me you're stupid for going to church. You're stupid for serving God. Why would you serve something that's not real? Why would you read a Bible that's irrelevant? Why, why are you reading a Bible that's an old outdated history book when they need to make a new Bible? I, and, and when the world tells you that, that's foolish talking. That's foolish thinking. But you got to stand on the promises of God knowing that he is not a man. He cannot lie. That his word will not return void. Whatever he says is going to come to pass. This this book is not outdated. This book is timeless for all generations. And there's no word that needs to be added or taken out of God's written word. It is the inspired word of God. Sinners show, he says that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Based off of Matthew chapter 5. So salt stings and light exposes. So people won't like you because you represent the kingdom. So when you bring light to darkness, guess what? They're going to hate you. Because you can't lead blind people if you're blind. So when God has opened your eyes and you're the salt of the world, you're the light of the world, and you bring that to dark places, they're not going to be happy with you. When the, the disciples were in the day in the book of Acts, I love the book of Acts and just seeing the power of the Holy Ghost. There was a girl who was demon possessed. She was doing witchcraft and the people, the source, they were making money off of her and she followed the disciples around everywhere. They got so irritated about at her. You know what? They cast the devil out of her and then the authorities, they got upset because they were making money off of the fortune telling. When you stand up for what's right, the world is going to reject you. But you stand firm on what God says and you do what his word says. You follow, you trust, and you obey even though you may lose some friends. You stand up for what is right. Life is built on character, character based on the decisions we make. Sinners show their hatred to God's people by avoiding them, by rejecting them. And by insulting them. And that comes from our text in Luke chapter 6 and verse 22. Sinners show their hatred by rejecting us, 
by insulting us, and by avoiding us. And so how should we treat our enemies? These are the things that Jesus is addressing. How do you treat people that do you wrong, even though you've been good to them? How do you treat these people? He said we must love them. And we must do good to them. Not only that, but we must pray for them. Sometimes I have a bad feeling in my heart about somebody who's done me wrong. And God said, you got to let that go. And I said, how, God? He says, you got to pray for them. And people that have hurt me that don't even speak to me anymore, I pray for them. And I say, Lord, I wish the best for this person. I wish the best for their family. I wish the best for their children. God, I pray that their eyes will be open, that they'll walk in fullness of light of who you are, and they can be obedient and be blessed and make it to heaven. And God wants you to get to that place where you can pray for those who have done you wrong and say, Lord, I pray that he will come to the place where he repents or she repents and turns to you. That's where God wants you to be. Not wishing and hoping that they fall and hoping that they get what they deserve. But to give them grace and mercy. Why? Because hatred only breeds more hatred. If there's a fire, you got a choice. If you're either going to put a bucket of water on that fire or you're going to throw gasoline in that fire. Gasoline just makes the flame bigger. It makes a bigger mess. It makes the situation worse. Not only that, the word of God says vengeance belongs to the Lord. So it's not up to us to put our hands in the situation and try to fix it. It's up to the Lord. So hatred only breeds more hatred. And the book of James chapter 1 verse 20 says, The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let God have the final say. Let God judge the way he's going to judge leave it up to him and you trust him and you love them in spite of whatever they have done this cannot be done in our own strength brother Allen. just like you said i don't think i could find it in my heart to forgive that person it cannot be done in our flesh but it can be done done through the power of the holy spirit so you might say i can't find it in my heart to forgive this person but God, I need your Holy Spirit to help me because I really need you to help me get over this thing. As I mentioned last week, if you hold on to it, you put yourself in a prison. You put yourself in bondage by holding on to the pain. You got to let that go and free yourself. Don't do it for them. Do it for yourself. Do it for your family. Do it for your own relationship with God so that your sins can be forgiven. So you can receive grace and you can receive mercy because there's going to come a time where you're going to mess up. We're not perfect. And you're going to want somebody to give you a second chance. I'm thankful that we serve a God of a second chance. He has given us a second chance. Everybody deserves a second chance. And he says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We must have wisdom as citizens of the kingdom. As kingdom citizens, we must have wisdom. I'm not talking about knowledge. The book of James talks about the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Have you ever met a smart fool? Somebody that's got a PhD but no common sense? You ever met anybody like that? So James differentiates the difference of, of, he separates wisdom and knowledge. I'm not talking about knowledge. I'm not talking about being smart. There's people who read this book cover to cover that could quote it better than us, including the devil himself. Doesn't mean that you have wisdom. So as citizens of kingdom, we must have wisdom to know when to turn the other cheek. That takes wisdom. I remember growing up, I've never been in one fight my entire life. And there's guys that I talk to that can't believe that. But as a little boy, my dad says, you always walk away. Be the bigger person. Because you put your hands on somebody, you hurt them, you kill them, or whatever the case may be, you're going to pay for that. And he says, be the bigger person and always walk away. And every fight that I've come across, I've walked away. Guess what? You get to live another day. You get to stay out of jail. You get to stay out of, uh, uh, out of just messy situations. And I thank God for teaching me that because there are some times in school where kids were bullying me. And, man, I knew I had what it take to either knock them out or call my buddies who were bigger and stronger. And I just had to walk away. 
but it applies in your life now. You ha have the power. Doesn't mean you will abuse your power. You know there are some people you can call to help you fight. You know there's some things you could do to help you win this battle. But you got to have wisdom to know when to walk away and turn the other cheek and say, God, you take care of that. I know there's some things I could do to get back. We're not trying to get back. Let God have his way. Christians as kingdom citizens, love must exercise discernment. Through the Holy Spirit, you have to discern what God is telling you and how he is directing you. See things in the spirit realm. How do you do that? Open the word of God, pray, and ask for wisdom. Before Jesus, in this same Luke, called his disciples, he spent all night in prayer. He was connected to the anointing and the power and the wisdom that came from God. When he cast the demon out of that possessed boy, the, dis the father said, your disciples could not cast out this devil. Because before that, Jesus, the word says, Jesus gave them power over the demons. The disciples, people say healing is not for us. Jesus gave them power. He says, I'm going to give you power to cast out devils. I'm going to give you power to lay hands on the sick. So the disciples got excited and they're casting out devils in the name of Jesus. They're laying their hands on the sick and performing miracles and they're happy and things are happening. And they came back to God rejoicing to Jesus saying, we laid hands on the sick. They were healed. We, we cast out devils and they fleed. Jesus said, don't be rejoicing over this. They started getting pride, pride and proud and puffed up. He said, don't re rejoice over that. He said, rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He said, the prophets hoped to see this day and didn't, didn't, did not see it. But I gave the power to you. So when they went and they laid hands, now they come to a situation in the book of Mark chapter 9 where they lay hands on this demon-possessed boy. Jesus was up in the mountain praying. That's where his source, that's where his strength, that's where he drew the anointing of God. When the disciples were busy doing and performing and walking and, and just being busy, this father brought his son to the disciples and said, will you cast this demon out? And all of a sudden they couldn't do it. And when the crowd went away and they were in a private place, they went to Jesus and said, well, how come we couldn't cast this one out? And Jesus said, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. There are some battles in your life that you will not get over unless you pray, unless you fast. There are some chains and darkness and demons and devils in your life, in the life of your family, your marriage, your job. That cannot be broken in your personal life. There are some chains that cannot be broken unless you pray and fast. God didn't tell us if we fast. He says when you fast. David fasted. Moses. All the great men and women of the Bible. They fasted. Peter. Paul. Jesus himself fasted. You have to fast. You know when, when my son had the seizure that day. I was fasting that day. And I said, Lord, I thank you that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you gave me the wisdom to doctor him up and make sure he was okay. And I, I, I commend that to the Holy Spirit's guidance. But who knows what would have happened if I was not fasting. When you fast, you don't know what lies ahead. You don't know what storm God is wanting to get you through or save you from. But you got to fast and pray. And there are some things that will not change in your life. Until you find yourself in a secret place with God. That's where the power, that's where the anointing, that's where the healing comes from. And, and, and the Bible says that by faith, so many things happen. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you will not have faith to say to this mountain, be moved, if you never open your Bible and see the authority that you have as a kingdom citizen. Because as a kingdom citizen, God said, I have given you power. I have anointed you with my Holy Spirit to set the captives free, to heal the sick, and to cast out devils. But if you don't read his word and you don't know what's written in it, you will not have the faith to do it when the time comes. When the devil, he came and tempted Jesus who was on the mountain. He said, it is written, tempt not the Lord your God.
you got to know what's in this Bible. Because the storms that are coming your way, it's going to take faith for you to get through it. If there is no foundation, your house is going to fall apart. You got to know what's in here. Build your foundation on the rock. Jesus, he said, who do men say that I am? Some say Elias. He says, who do you say that I am? He said, you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. He said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Build your foundation on the authority and the principles of the biblical truths that are found in God's written word. Build your house on Jesus Christ because a storm is either coming your way or in your life right now. And if there's no foundation, you're going to fall apart. God showed me that. He said, people don't have faith to believe God for healing because they don't know what's written in the word. How can you know and believe what God says if you never read it? How can you know you have authority over devils? Somebody said to me the other day, I'm scared of demons. You know why you're scared of demons? Because you didn't read your Bible. Because if you read your Bible and you open it, the Bible says, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, you have authority over devils. But the devils, if they know that you have no idea that, they, that you have authority over them, they will torment you. They will get into your head because why? They know that you don't even understand the authority that you walk in. When you step into a room, demons should flee because you walk in the anointing of God. They should fear when they see you coming. When Jesus came, the, the, the demons in that boy said, Oh, son of David, what art thou with me? They recognized who he was and what he came to do, which was cast them out. They said, cast us to the swine. Animals can be possessed. He, they came out of the boy. They went into the swine. And then the swine went off and drowned. Walk in your citizen kingdom authority. But you got to open your Bible and know where you stand with God. And the authority he has given you. Because if you do, you won't fear devils. You won't fear trouble. That's why Jesus was able to sleep in the storm. You can rest at night. You don't need to have anxiety and depression. The disciples got anxious. Jesus, don't you care? There's a storm coming. You brought us out here to die. And Jesus is sleeping on the bottom of the boat on a pillow. He said, you have little faith. Do you not know what's written in the word? Do you not understand your authority? He said, you faithless generation, how long will I be with you? And you don't understand. And he said to the storm, be still. You have the authority in Jesus' name. You can go to the next slide. It is not important that we've, we are vindicated before our enemies, but that we become more like God in our character. So instead of trying to figure out how am I going to get back at Mr. Allen for what he did to me, you know what? I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. You know why? I want my character to be more like God. So I can love you and pray for you and say God bless you. I can go up to people I know they can't stand my guts. I say I love you. It's good to see you today. God bless you. And I know they can't stand me. I know it. I see it on the, I can, I can smell it. I mean, you, any of you can smell hatred. <laughs> you see it from a mile away. You know just somebody doesn't like you the way they, their, their body language changes when you come into their presence. And you want to say, you know what, forget about you anyway. I got, I got other friends. No, you go up to them and you say, God bless you. And you pronounce a blessing over their life. Not curses. God says, you can't bless me with your lips and curse with those same lips. Amen. Let's go to the next slide. As his disciples, we must see clearly in order to be able to guide others in their spiritual walk. We cannot lead others where we have not been ourselves. I was in Tennessee a couple years ago, and I was at the park with my kids and my mother-in-law, my wife. Now, I don't want to be offensive, but this guy, I mean, 300 pounds obese, came up to us and passing out flyers. And he says, I'm a fitness instructor. If you ever need somebody to help you with your fitness and nutrition and exercise, I'm your guy. And I looked at this obese guy, 300 pounds, and I said, thank you. In my heart, I think it. What in the world makes me think? I can trust you with my nutrition and my exercise when you're carrying around 300 pounds obese. But you're going to tell me, how can you lead somebody where you haven't been? 
He may have the knowledge to tell you how to do it. I don't want people with knowledge. I want somebody that's been through something with experience to say, you know what? I lost my son, but I'm in church. I'm holding on to God's never-ending hands. I want some people who are real and could walk with me and talk to me and say, I've experienced these things. I've experienced hurt. I've experienced pain. I've experienced heartbreak. And I can still walk with Jesus. I want to be around those people. I don't want to be around people who've never been through anything. See, when you haven't been through something, you can only imagine what that person is going through. There's some people tell me, I want a pastor. You think it's glamorous. Wait till you start doing it. Why do you think so many pastors are either committing suicide? There was one pastor, there were two services, an 8 o'clock and a 10 o'clock. He preached in the 8 o'clock service, prayed, led an altar call, won souls to the kingdom. 10 o'clock comes around, they can't find the pastor. He was out of house with a gun in his lap, blowing his head off. Why do you think pastors are walking away? Why do you think they're falling and they're slipping? Because it's glamorous. But you can only imagine what you think it's like until you start doing it. Until you get in the ring. See, some people want to tell you how to fight. But you're not in the ring. So you don't know what it's like unless you're in the ring. When you're in the ring, Pastor Felix has been there. He, he passes. He knows. I can talk to him. But there's people, oh, if I had a church, I would do this. Oh, yeah, well, you go do it and show us how it's done. They've done that. People have done that left, and it fell apart. Why? There's no foundation. You thought it's about coming on a preaching on a Sunday morning. This is 10% of what we do. You got to be all things to all people at all times. That's what they expect. But there's got to be barriers. There's got to be family time. There's some pastors that are so busy, they have no prayer life because they just workaholics. They've turned it into just works. God doesn't want you to preach his gospel and then pray for people and then teach his word and serve in the community. And after that, you're a castaway. He said, depart, I never knew you. How can you take people where you have never been? How can you identify with somebody who has lost a loved one when you never have? You can imagine and you can feel sorry, but when you have been there, you come up from a place of experiencing what's that like. Now you can say, look. I know that it's tough right now, but you'll get through it because we serve a God that loves you. And that person that you lost, that loved one in your life, you didn't love them more than God loved them because he is their creator. That was his child. Miss Maggie was God's baby girl. And you can never love Miss Maggie more than God does. And you can trust and bet that she is in a far better place than any of us down here. We are in here. We have to face all these misery and turmoils and trials and struggles. And the enemy who is like a roaring lion constantly trying to steal your joy, defeat you, and tear your family apart. I'm excited to be with Jesus. I can't wait. I, I, I want to be like Elijah hiding in the cave saying, Lord, take my life. I'm ready. Because there's nothing good down here. Nothing good down here. Nothing good down here. But for us to serve God and trust him and wait for that day where we'll see his face. Dr. Man, I can't wait to rejoice with you in heaven. But how many of you know some people can't worship God here? What do you think we're going to be doing in heaven? We can't find time to praise God on earth. What do, we, what do you think is going to happen in heaven? You think we're going to be building houses and getting promotions? Getting Ferraris in heaven? You think that's what we're going to be doing? You can't find the time and the... Uh, the sacrifice to serve God here. But yet we talk about heaven. Let me move on because I don't want to take all of your time. I'm getting ready to wrap up. He says, this is a warning against pride. Pride will cause spiritual blindness. People who are criticizing others, people who are criticizing pastors, people who are criticizing churches, they are often guilty of something worse in their own lives. That's why Jesus said, how can you take the plank out of somebody else's eye when you have a log in your own eye? I want to ask you today to stop criticizing people. Stop criticizing your pastor. Stop criticizing your leaders. 
Stop criticizing your church. Stop criticizing your children. Stop criticizing your spouse. Stop criticizing your boss. Stop criticizing your coworkers. Stop criticizing your siblings. You have no idea what it's like being in their shoes. Let's go to the next one. Fruit is always true to character. An apple tree will always produce apples. We went to Brother Allen's house, and man, he had some mulberries. We picked those mulberries. We ate them. And then Miss Maria made a jam, and man, I couldn't put that jam down. We put it on the toast with eggs, and whoo, that mulberry tree will never produce grapes. Never. An apple tree produces apples, not oranges. A good person will only produce good fruit, not evil. You can't call yourself a citizen of the kingdom of God, and you're producing bad fruit. What comes out of the lips reveals what's in the heart. Somebody got into an argument and they cursed. And they said, that's not me. That's not who I am. His buddy said to him, that is who you are because that was in your heart. That's why it came out. Your words reveal what's in the heart. Choose your words wisely. We must be honest with ourselves and admit that there are blind spots in our lives that we need to correct. That we need to let God correct. We need to admit that there are obstacles that blur our vision. We want to help people, but yet our vision is blurred. How can you help somebody when your vision is blurred? Let's go on to the next one. Not everyone who professed to know the Lord has had a real, true experience of salvation. Just because you come to church, just because you say I'm a Christian, does not mean you've had a true experience of Jesus Christ. Many have been active in the church. Go back to the last one. But in the church and in other religions, you could go back one. If they are not saved by faith, there is no foundation. You can go to church, you can wear a fancy suit, you can walk the walk and not have ever had a true experience with Jesus Christ. Totally miss it. So let's go on. No foundation. If we are rooted and built in him, our fruits will be good and our house will be able to withstand the storm. When we're rooted and built in him, our fruits will be good. Our house will be able to withstand the storm. You ever seen some people doing really good until a storm hits their family? Now they split up. There was no foundation. Is that the last one? As my, uh, you all know my wife's going through some stuff with her mom with the, the, the cancer. We're believing God for healing. And I see where the enemy at times find, looking for a seal, a crack in the foundation to stick his head in. And every night, I open the word, and we pray, and we read the Bible. Because I want, I know this is a storm, and I don't want our house to fall apart. I want our house to be built on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And so we pray and read the word because the Bible says that the man ought to wash his wife with the watering of the word. That's your responsibility. She may never pick up the Bible, but you do it. You bring your family together and read the word of God with them. Explain it to them. If you're not sure how to do that on Wednesday nights, there's classes with all ages, elementary, middle, high school, young adults. They're being fed, and, and these are good teaching. I mean, we were in the elementary class. Eric Lori was teaching on the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, and I'm thinking, wow, they're deep. This isn't, I mean, they're being fed meat. <laughs> but wash your wife. I talked about last week that wives are meant to be covered. By God, by their husbands, washing with water of the word. You stay rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ and let that be your foundation to get you through the storm. Because without that, without Jesus, without Jesus, you have no hope. Zero. You have no chance without Jesus Christ in your life. And as I saw my, my, my buddy laying there in that casket, 
And I was reflecting on that. I said, Lord, whatever you have for me to do, I want to do it with everything that lies in my power. I want to trust you. I want to walk with you. And I said, not only that, but the people I come in contact with, I want to have an intentional relationship with them to where my life can demonstrate his goodness. Because I don't ever want to see anybody pass away without having a relationship with Jesus Christ. As I was praying about that, God says, it's time for the church to get busy. Because if we'll go out there and win souls, his house is going to be full. We got to get back out in the streets, church. We got to get outside of these four walls because there are people out there that are dying, literally dying, without knowing who he is. And God has called and appointed the church to win the loss. He told Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. I said, Lord, what can I do to prove and to just give back for you dying on the cross? And this is the only reason I preach the gospel today. When times get tough, I'll be honest, I called my dad a couple months ago and I was crying. I said, Dad, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm done. And he said, no, son, you got to hold on. And the Lord reminded me, he said, if you love me, you feed my sheep. No matter what they say about you, no matter how they treat you, no matter what you do, you feed my sheep. You preach the gospel, you win souls for my kingdom. That's your assignment. Don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Those horses, they have blinders on. Why? So they don't get off track, they don't get distracted. Keep your eyes on Jesus if you got to get blinders and stay focused on him. I heard a powerful thing this pastor said. He tells his church every day, the first 15. The first 15 minutes of your day, if you can go beyond that, great. 30 minutes, an hour. Spend the first 15 with God. 15 minutes. If you got to be at work at 8 a.m. and you wake up at 6, get up 15 minutes earlier. You want your family to survive? Build your house on a foundation of Jesus Christ. If you work overnight, and you wake up at 2 in the afternoon, wake up at 1.45 and give God the first 15. Give him your first fruits. First fruits, yes, is money and all that, but first fruits is also your time. We get so busy and we just wake up and go to work and come back home and go to sleep and eat, sleep. Give God something. And somehow looking at my buddy laying in that casket did something to me. I said, Lord, one day I'm going to be there because the Bible said it's upon it on the man wants to die and after that the judgment. I said, when I lay in my casket, when I lay my head to rest, I want to know that I've done what you call me to do because I may not live till 70. I may not live till 80. So I'm not going to wait another decade to start getting serious. I want to do that now. I want to win souls. He says, go out and win souls. Tell them about who I am because people are dying without knowing who he is. Feed my sheep. If you're a true citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you're going to be fruitful and multiply. You're going to make disciples. So everybody you come in contact with, you ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit to give you the confidence and boldness to talk to them about who Jesus is. Share your testimony. He said they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Tell somebody what God has done in your life. As I called my buddy that's a police officer in Nashville, I told him the situation about my son. He was devastated. He said, there's nowhere, there's no chance I would have taken. I would have called the paramedics because I've picked up a lot of dead babies. And I've seen what seizures can do. But that really bothered him that I went through that. We were roommates in college. And he says, you have the true heart of a pastor. He says, when I talk to you, all you do is give me illustrations that point me back to Jesus. And when you can live with somebody for three, four years, they've seen your character, they see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they can say, you're a man after God's heart. I thank God for keeping me. Because those same people that may not be on the right track today, 
five years down the road, they're going to be watching your life. The things you say and how you act and how you respond to circumstances. In your life, your testimony is going to be a witness to them of who Jesus Christ is. And I don't know about you, church, but I want to get more serious about winning souls. And I want you to get more serious about your personal relationship with God and building your house on the true foundation, but also winning souls and being a witness of who Jesus Christ is. The Word of God says, He that wins souls is wise. Blessed are the feet of those who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Find somebody in your life who you can mentor. Find somebody who you can disciple. Find somebody who you can bring along with you. There's people dying, carrying the mantle in, in their hands to the grave. You take that mantle and you pass it on to some younger child, some younger boy, some younger daughter. The Word of God says the, the, the elders, the elder woman are ought to teach the younger. The older man of wisdom, you can go to people like Mr. Glenn and say, I got this problem. How can you help me? And learn and respect our elders and work together in unity and one accord so that we can rejoice with the Father. And if you're here today, if you're watching online, maybe you've called yourself a Christian, but you're not sure where you stand with Jesus. I want you to make things right today. God wants you to make things right today. If you're here and you're not even sure, you're watching online, you're not even sure, the Word of God says that wh whoever confesses their sins and calls on my name will be saved. And I'm going to ask right now that you will call on the name of the Lord. I ask right now that you will say to God with all sincerity of what's in your heart, say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know that you are Lord and Savior. And I ask you to come into my heart. Make me clean. Reveal the things to me that are keeping me blind, that are keeping me bound. Show me one person this week that I can testify of your goodness. Help me to go out and be intentional and to win souls. Thank you for all that you've done in my life and what you're going to do. This storm that I'm in, I put it in your hands because you care for me. As I read your word, and your Holy Spirit comes inside of me. Let my house be built on a firm foundation. So that when the storm comes, when the enemy comes in like a flood, we won't fall apart. Lord, help me to spend the first 15 minutes of my day in your presence praying worshiping praising reading your word in Jesus name amen God bless you will you just give God a great big hand of appreciation this morning I'm going to ask Mr. Allen to pray us out and give us the benediction as we get ready to go home